everyone. I love our PAC members so much. I always love the slideshows at the beginning of these. I'm Amber Kaiser. I am part of the communications team at the Dog Aging Project. I'm super excited to welcome you for today's community appreciation event. We have a great topic for you. We are going to be talking about canine genomics with Kathleen Morrill. Uh, we have over 500 breeds already represented in the Dog Aging Project pack, as well as thousands of wonderful and unique mixed breed dogs. And so it's gonna be super fun for us to talk about the genomic portion of our study with Kathleen today. A couple of just technical reminders for those of you who are joining us for the first time. You're watching on YouTube Live. This will still be available on YouTube and you can share it with other folks who might be interested after the fact. You can ask questions in the chat on the YouTube, but if you go to the link underneath this video, you'll be able to go to the dog park, which is our uh, participant forum for all the members of the Dog Aging Project who want to interact and connect with each other and our team on the dog park. You can ask questions in the, in the there's a thread there. If you post a question or a comment in the thread on the dog park, you'll also be entered to win um, one of our giveaways, our prize giveaways for today. Also, I think I need to apologize in, in advance if my own pack goes a little crazy today. I'm house sitting another dog who seems to like to bark at many things. So hopefully that won't happen because she's asleep right now, but she might. So uh, now I want to introduce Kathleen. She can turn on her camera and join us. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. Hi, Amber. Hi, everyone. So Kathleen is a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and the Broad Institute, where she is working on her research around behavioral genomics in pet dogs. She's supporting the Dog Aging Project by developing our genomic reports around breed ancestry and genetic, genetic diversity. And she's designing our genomic studies to discover these genetic factors of healthy aging, age-related declines, and exceptional longevity in the dogs in our pack. So we are so happy to have you here today. Yay. Glad to be here. So I thought maybe we'd start by just, maybe you could tell folks a little bit about why you wanted to be part of this crazy project. Yeah, so for the past four or five years, I've been working on my PhD uh, dissertation on canine behavior and genetics. And I've done a lot of what we call cross-sectional work, which is looking at dogs in the state they are at the time, at the age they are, and what kind of health or behavior um, trait they're expressing, what's their condition at that time. And that can be really powerful. Um, but what was exciting about the Dog Aging Project is we're looking to do that, plus this what we call longitudinal study, looking across dogs as they age, where you can get at things like, what's the age of onset of a particular disease? Um, how does the dog's activity change with time? all these kind of um, elements that you don't quite get with cross-sectional data. So it's a really exciting next step, including the interaction between genetics and environment. So I, I'll remind our viewers out there that the important health and behavioral data that Kathleen is really relying on for her research comes from the Health and Life Experience Survey, which you all filled out when you joined the project, and then the annual follow-up survey. Um, a couple months back, we had a nice conversation with Audrey Rupel, who's our lead researcher on our annual follow-up survey. Um, and it's super important for everybody to update all of that health and behavioral information every year because it allows Kathleen to really do the work she's doing. Yeah, dogs are not static. They don't stay the same. They grow, they change, and um, genomics is kind of finally meeting the challenge of that and uncovering what we can find in the DNA that maybe influences those changes in some way. And I know when you're gonna show us some slides of some, some data coming up, and we'll talk a little bit more when you do that about the importance of sort of the big data aspect of the Dog Aging Project, right? It's, it's we, can, we can investigate research issues that you couldn't with 100 dogs or 200 dogs, but you can with 30,000 dogs, right? Yeah, I'm gonna share a little interesting experiment where I show exactly what we can find as we increase the number of dogs we're looking at. 
Sweet. I love it. I am. Um, I have the pleasure of working with you in a number of different fronts and I'm trained as a geneticist. So when we talk about genetic stuff, I'm like all in, I like I love our conversations, but Kathleen is also an amazing coder. And uh, when I'm in those meetings, I don't even understand half the things she says, but I love that too. <laughs> I get caught up in that, you know, it's its own language type of thing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I just like to listen. Um, okay. So I thought we would also uh, talk a little bit just about the process of how the dogs in the pack get involved in the genomic part portion of the study. Um, we have grant funding for to sequence the genomes of 10,000 dogs, and we have 30,000 dogs in our pack. And so that means that our team has to make decisions about where we can send those DNA swab kits out, right? So do you wanna, should we just talk a little bit about how those decisions are made? Um, do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, let's go back and forth a little bit. Okay. I know one of the most important things of course is kind of getting a very diverse and representative sample of dogs, especially across different sizes um, and ancestries. Um, so that's one of our prioritization aspects is, you know, we don't want to just study the large dogs or just the small dogs. We want to make sure we're representing both groups there. And you've, you've worked with the golden retriever lifetime study as well. Is that right? I actually haven't. Um, I've worked on a few different canine projects. I work, um, with Darwin's arc for the behavioral genetics, um, and a few different sub projects that have stemmed from that. But yeah, the golden retriever lifetime study is a really interesting one. And I just brought it up because it, you know, we sort of, feel like in, a, in some ways that was the progenitor of the dog aging project, but then taking some of those concepts about following dogs over their entire life, lifetime and then expanding it to this wider range of genetic backgrounds. So, um, so we're looking when we are inviting folks to join what we call the foundation cohort, which is the genetic part of the study um, for, as Kathleen mentioned, as many breeds as possible, as many mixed breed dogs as possible. So a big range there, range of sizes. And um, we are looking at um, a range of ages of dogs, right, for that. Um, and then geographic distribution across the US too. Um, so hopefully we will be able to expand our funding and sequence another 10,000 dogs, um, but that's sort of where we, we start. Once a participant has been invited to join foundation and they read our informed consent form and sign that and then are part of that cohort, we send a DNA swab kit. And that's pretty easy. I pilot tested that for our crew, right? You just swab your dog's cheek. Is there, do you have anything you wanna tell people about the, just the, the, the sample piece, right? Saliva versus yeah. blood or like that kind of thing. I think one of the interesting things about the saliva samples, which we're going to look into a little bit more is the way we're doing our data collection is through DNA sequencing. But saliva doesn't contain just your dog's DNA, but it also contains, you know, what other microbes are living in their mouth, um, kind of what we call the oral microbiome. And microbiome is another side project or not, another main project in the dog aging project um, where you might be looking at the fecal microbiome so we may have projects where we compare, you know, the microbes in your dog saliva, which we get as kind of a side product of um, our sequencing to the fecal microbiome. And what can we learn there? And maybe you can learn stuff about, you know, um, dental health too. Right. And because a lot of the recommendations from our veterinary team about healthy aging in dogs has to do with things like dental care. Yeah. In terms of, of actionable items for dog owners. Yeah. It's kind of an unexplored front, but it's... um and an idea I've been thinking about a bit. Yeah, and also like little asterisk, right? That kind of this is how science works, right? That we go into this with one goal, but all of a sudden you're already thinking about other questions that we might yeah. ask with the same information, which is why science is so awesome. But yeah, with the swab, I'd say, you know, just give, if you receive one of these kits, give it some time in your dog's cheek. Um, the idea is and you don't have to scrape them at all, but just give them some time. If they gnaw on it, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So after uh, then the a part, a owner swabs the dog's cheek and sends the kit back, what happens? So 
it ends up going to one of our uh, partner laboratories right now, that's uh, Neogen. And they will be extracting DNA from that sample and running it on a DNA sequencer at low coverage. It basically means it samples a little bit of all of the genome, um, which is slightly different than a lot of the commercial kits where they directly test specific spots on the DNA and get high, co high confidence um, genotypes. We kind of get a bunch of genotypes across the genome um, at varying confidence levels based on the technique. But um, after the sequencing data comes through, it runs through our data analysis pipeline um, with GenCove that compares the sequencing um, reads, these kind of strings of A, T, C, and G, to a database of over 700 dogs um, from various breeds, mixed breed dogs, and village dogs to infer um, what the most likely genotypes are across the dog's DNA. And this might be a good time to bring in um, the slides actually. Yeah, let's do it. I'll turn off my camera and uh, you can share your slides. So I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the genetic variants we're getting here. So just had a little interest slide here, um, genetics and DNA kits for research and for fun. And what we're most interested in are these genotypes. What a dog has at different spots on their DNA from their mother and their father, um, the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's. And through our pipeline, um, we can call 50 to 60 million genotypes. And that's an incredible amount. The dog genome is about 3 billion um, DNA bases long. On the scale of around 680,000 of these markers, um, these genotypes are useful for predicting a dog's ancestry from breeds. Fewer than 100 of those actually can be used to um, predict what their physical appearance might be, what their coat color is, their coat length, their body size. The rest of those millions of markers are what we're putting into making scientific discoveries about their health, about their behavior, aging, and lifespan. For breed ancestry, um, the most important thing about those markers, and there was a question I think on um, the PAC forms about this, um, what are these ancestry markers? What are these 600,000 um, we're using to infer ancestry? And what they really are, are these kind of what we call neutral mutations, um, changes to DNA that don't really affect form or function, but which can be used to track lineage or compare dogs to known populations. And the best kind of markers are those that really uniquely identify a particular breed lineage. Say this marker is most useful, say, for inferring that a dog has ancestry from American Pit Bull Terrier versus this is a less useful marker if it can't tell the difference between German Shepherd dogs and Australian Shepherd dogs. But um, that's kind of the idea that goes into us selecting these genetic markers to infer ancestry. The trait predictions, which I'm going to get a little bit into um, what you can expect after your dog's DNA is sequenced if you're enrolled in one of these cohorts, but we can also make predictions about what their coat colors might be. This here is just a sampling of 50 dogs that we've sequenced so far for the Dog Aging Project, and a good portion of them, based on a couple of genes we can predict, would have black coat color. Um, a smaller portion would have, say, the blue coat color dilute or these liver coat color. So these are some interesting uh, what we call phenotypes we can predict based on the DNA without even looking at your dog. But for the scientific studies, um, some of the things we're really interested in doing is identifying what the landscape of DNA is and how it affects traits like health, traits like lifespan, um, physical appearance, behavior. And the way we do this is we need a lot of dogs on the scale of thousands and we need to compare them. Say the dogs in red um, are known to have um, some form of cancer at some on age of onset, whereas the dogs in purple are generally healthy, haven't had a history of cancer. We will go across the DNA and compare what kind of genotypes the dogs in this category have to the dogs in the other category. And that would tell us that this particular spot on the DNA is associated with that cancer we'd carry this out across the whole genome and kind of uncover this mountain, this landscape of association um, that tells us a little bit more about 
where in the DNA is important for shaping this trait. And this is hugely dependent on um, the number of dogs we sequence too. So I've done a little study where I'm looking at body size differences in dogs. And I wanna find the genes that are responsible for making dogs small or making them large. I have downsampled kind of the set we have to 50 dogs. And you can see here, this line is kind of our threshold for saying that something is real, that there's a real signal somewhere on the DNA that's associated with this trait. And at 50 dogs, we're not really coming up with anything. This landscape is a flat plateau. As we increase to 100 dogs, we're already uncovering a few genes that relate to this trait. Bumping it up to 250, we're really starting to see a little more of this landscape, but there's some uncertainty there. Some of these associations that we saw before are dropping down, but we're understanding a little bit more as we are looking at more of the dog population. When we bring it to a thousand dogs, which is where we, we are at now with the dog aging project, we have around 1300 dog sequence so far of the 10,000. Um, we're uncovering a lot more of the genes responsible and we're kind of seeing the relative importance of these genes too for shaping body size. And if you look right here, we see a signal coming up here that we haven't been able to say is real yet. When we get to 2000 dogs, we can be more confident. And this is kind of the threshold of where canine genomics is at as a field. The most recent largest study I've seen is um, out of Embark for differences in red coat color from yellow Labradors to very intensely red Irish setters. Um, they used about around 3,000 dogs to receive um, results like this. So when we're saying we're getting to 10,000, we're kind of going where dog genetics has never gone before. And the things we can uncover with 10,000, the landscape that we can uncover, um, the possibilities are almost limitless. This makes me super excited. I'm, I'm really excited every <laughs> day more. When more samples come in with data, it's exciting. It's a good day. So there are quite a few questions that have to do um, with this, uh, this end goal of having genetic markers for disease. So could you talk a little bit about how what you're doing may inform that? Yeah. So it's not just about um, genetic markers for disease, but Dog Aging Project also collecting a lot of environmental data, lifestyle data. Um, the hope is not just to have, say, a marker of a genetic disease that might occur, but also the kind of interventions, medications, ways that could minimize the effects of genetics through environmental means. So while we may, we may be eventually producing particular tests that will be informative about a dog's health risk. We're hopefully also on the other hand, going to come out with ways to minimize that risk. Some of you who have recently filled out the health and life experience survey might remember that there are questions about things like what kind of pipes bring water into your home, right? So that's an environmental measure. Are they PVC pipes or yeah. copper pipes or lead pipes or whatever? Um, just like us, dogs get exposed to a lot of different things just through their daily life. And, and, and this is, you know, partially why the information that we learn from dogs is translatable to human health at some point down the road too, right? Because we're sharing this environment. Yeah. And for better or for worse, um, a lot of canine, canine genomics has been driven by human health goals. Mm. Um, it's why they, a lot of people study the genetic diseases that affect breeds is because of their relevance to human health, but that shouldn't be the only goal involved in studying dogs. Right, right. And I think that's part of what brings our whole team and all of our participants together, right? Is that we want best lives possible for our dogs. So, uh, so, in, so some people are probably familiar with this idea of diagnostic genetic testing. And certainly we are for humans, right? That if you have a particular risk element, you might go in to see a genetic counselor and get a genetic test to see if pot potentially you have a, you know, a genetic marker for disease. Um, and those exist for dogs too, I assume, right? Yeah, they do. So there are a lot of commercial kits that will test, I think up to 200 different health markers, um, things that have been found before, um, 
a lot of them are relevant to particular breeds or groups of breeds, um, and they can be informative when you're thinking about health, but there also haven't been um, too many studies on what the risks associated with those variants are. And we may be able to look at a, some portion of those as well across the dog aging project cohorts and give a better picture of if you have this genotype, what is the percent chance the disease is actually going to occur? And is that affected by other factors? Right, by the environmental or lifestyle yeah. factors that we're talking about. Yeah, so we're getting a higher resolution of um, information that we can use to know more about those known diagnostic tests as well. And do you think then that the work that your work will potentially lead to future diagnostics for things we haven't even thought about being able to test for? I'm sure it will. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like there, there will certainly be some low hanging fruit and then there'll be some things that, you know, we may want to get more funding to sequence hundred thousand dogs. If we want to address some of the bigger questions like cancer. Yeah. We definitely want to do that. Of course. <laughs> So, but I do think it's important for our participants who, who may end up being in part of this genetic study to know that we, when we're returning genetic results to them, it is not, we're not returning medical diagnostics to them. Do you want to talk a little bit about the information that we're returning? Yeah. So the information we're returning is mostly fun information. It's um, information about your dog's breed ancestry. Um, it is information about inbreeding because that's an important metric that we're interested in studying. Um, and we're interested in these physical trait predictions, which I think are always fun. Um, there's a lot of Facebook groups dedicated to guessing what genes a dog has just based on their photo, because these are some fairly well understood um, genes involved in coat type, coat color. And we wanna tell you about them if we find them in your dog. And actually this might be a time where we can show a little preview of the, um, yeah, the this is a, that users will see. Yeah, this is a project yeah. Kathy and I have been working together on. So we're excited to give you the first sneak preview. Yeah, let's do that. It's a little rough. There's a few placeholders here, something like dog name. Your dog's actual name will be there. But this report will essentially tell you a little bit about what you've already told us which because we have 101 breeds in our panel, not 500 like are enrolled in um, dog aging project, we won't necessarily um, detect them all. But then we get into the breeds that we can detect. What per percentage of your dog's ancestry is most similar to these breeds? And there might be a lot of breeds in here that go beyond this plot. So we'll of course have a little hover over here that you can see the smaller percentages that might contribute to your dog's ancestry. We also want to tell you a little bit about their genetic variation, this coefficient of inbreeding score, which um, you know, is a measure of how much genetic variation is in your dog's genome compared to populations of dogs in general. Um, this is kind of looking at your dog's maternal mother's and paternal father's um, genotypes. And of course, we expect breeds to be a little bit higher in the scale depending on the breed, um, and that's to be expected. Then we have the trait prediction section, which is kind of cool. We'll have different categories of traits like body size, coat color, coat pattern, white spotting, coat type, and these special features that you can pop up and explore. So we have actually machine learning models that will take information about your dog's genes and their genotypes and predict kind of what scale of body size they are. This might be interesting if you've enrolled your dog as a puppy of mixed breed ancestry that you're not really sure um, what kind of size they're going to be when they grow up. Um, for a lot of this, though, it might be confirmatory. You might see and be like, yeah, my dog has that and my dog looks like that. But they can be kind of fun. We'll predict their um, base coat color, kind of whether they have brown coat, black coat, some coat pattern features such as sable and masking white spotting, which is kind of the scale from very piebald like uh, beagles to solid coat color. Some coat type features, like whether we predict your dog will have a curly coat, a straight coat, um, a gene that's been associated with shedding propensity in the past. And then some special features like um, whether your dog carries the genetic variant for uh, natural bobtail or corgi's short legs. 
And with any of these, we're also going to be asking for your feedback, both before we return results and after we return results. We want to know um, kind of whether they're what you expect your dog's ancestor will be and whether you were surprised by um, what we came up with or disagree. You can definitely um, tell us a little bit more about your dog, especially if we don't have their breed in our ancestor channel. But we're excited to be launching this in the imminent future. It's kind of, um, it's reaching its end stages of being ready. And for those dogs that have um, been sequenced, they'll be the first to receive results. And I think we're looking at that happening sometime in the fall yeah. for the first batch is what, mm -hmm. what our timing is looking like. Um, and we'll be enrolling dogs into this cohort probably for the next nine to 12 months, I would think. Uh, so uh, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to pose to you. Um, one from someone on our forum had to do about, uh, is there anything the dog DNA tells us about propensity for going gray with age? Oh, I think there have mostly been studies um, about the dilute coat color, which is, you know, this um, transition from having the very dark black pigment to a very gray pigment in their coat. But that's kind of throughout their whole life. Like, um, you know, some dogs are kind of blue, like Weimaraners. Mm -hmm. um, it's about that. Less about the progressive graying with age. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a current study, but it's something we could look into. Right, because like in my, in my family, none of the women in my family go gray. Even like my grandmother never went gray. Um, so, and the, our, our uh, participant was, you know, mentioned that diff dogs seem to go gray at different ages. Oh, that's interesting. They could be an excellent model for that. Yeah. Super interesting. Uh, okay. So let me just see about getting a few more questions answered here. Uh, so we actually got a little bit distracted from our, like, what happens Oh uh, yeah, after the DNA what, kit. What happens to the DNA kit? You talked about how you do your analysis. We talked about, um, but one of the questions is relevant to this because it was asking about genetic repositories for canine genetic data. Oh yeah. So, so what we, happens to our data? Yeah, so right after it becomes ready, when we have um, both the raw data and the genotypes, I start curating it in um, this cloud platform we called Terra.bio. Um, and where that happens is so that all the DAP researchers can then access the data and start doing research with it. And we also start getting it ready for the public releases, um, which I think occur on a year to year basis. Um, your dog's data um, genetically will become available to other genetics researchers for other projects they might be interested in. Um, and right after it becomes ready, we will also be processing it to generate their genomic report that we just went through. Yeah, so eventually we will have um, been building a repository of these 10,000 dogs too. Right, which will be available to researchers around the world. And in addition, mm -hmm. if we have um, extra samples, those get banked at the Cornell uh, Biobank. That's and right, so yeah. There are other samples there that are available. So if, you know, 10 years down, somebody has an idea for something they wanna look at, they can access those samples and use them. Yeah, we definitely have more ideas than we have hands. So <laughs> making it publicly available is really important. So everyone can explore all the different questions they might have. So stepping back a little bit to the breed calls and the genetic ancestry results that you showed us in that genomic return. We have some questions about that. Um, I also wanted to point out to folks, if you haven't seen the blog post that's up on our blog that Kathleen wrote, it goes into a lot more detail about how she actually makes those breed calls, how she says, you know, what she thinks the genetic ancestry of your dog is. Um, so, but this was the question I was going to ask is really, if you could talk a little bit more about reference panels, our reference panel, what that allows us to do. Um, and and it was sort of paired with a question about how some of the commercially available kits differ. And, and my understanding is those have to do with the reference panels a little bit. So could you maybe just talk yeah. about? 
yeah, to some degree, they do depend a lot on the reference panels. Um, the commercial kits certainly have more expansive reference panels in terms of how many breeds they're representing um, and which markers um, they use to make their breed calls. Uh, we're focusing on 101 breeds that we know are fairly prevalent in the US, um, have at least 12 dogs that have been sequenced at a higher depth. So we have um, more information to work with than we would if we used um, an array. And it's not static. We do plan to expand it at some point. Um, it's very dependent on getting representative dogs from the breed, not just um, a few dogs from one lineage within the breed, but across lineages in the breed so that we can make calls and dogs that might not be so close to any one lineage of say bulldog. So that's the genetic diversity piece that we wanna have both within our reference panels and in our whole study. Um, so we are so one of our one of your colleagues, Jessica Heckman, has is writing a piece about inbreeding and genetic diversity, and that'll be up on our blog tomorrow. So we'll we'll make sure we send a note out about that to everybody. Yeah, but the commercial kits are fantastic at telling you the breed ancestry of your dog. Um, we need the breed ancestry also for some of our research too. So it's good to both confirm dogs that are purebred from very common breeds and also tell us a little bit more about the ancestry content of the mixed breed dogs. It kind of uncovers a little bit more about their history. Um, so as we expand it, we're also helping our research out. I know one thing that you and I talked about when we were working on the genomic reports um, were how until we you know, expand that reference panel even further, some really closely related dogs might show up in our genomic return as something else. Like we were like, I think your example gave was that was that flat coated retrievers, for example, might would be would be called re Labrador retrievers, right? If yeah, we don't or test they might they might come up with a few different retriever types in there. And that's because some breeds share ancestry um, in the creation of those breeds. Um, sometimes they're sampling from multiple different breeds or they came from the same original stock or type of dog that people were interested in turning into a breed. So there's some overlap in those ancestry markers, for sure. And that's part of the reason that we want our participants to give us feedback on the genomic reports too. Right? Yeah, it helps clarify a lot. And there are certainly some breeds where we're getting closer to having the number of dogs we want for a panel. Mm -hmm. um, and if we positively identify a purebred of breed that we don't have in Dog Aging Project, we can use that information to help um, improve our predictions. Awesome. Uh, I was going to um, bring up a question from a viewer who teaches first year college biology for majors and uses dog coat color to teach concepts about Mendelian genetics yeah. and a bunch of other awesome, cool genetic stuff. Um, so the question was about alleles or loci that genomic biologists are using to distinguish between different breeds. So I know that on our genomic report, we actually mention the loci that we're using for a lot of those calls. Um, how, how will we share information about the breed calls? Yeah, well, there's, first off, there's 680,000 markers. So you're not gonna, quite, do, you're not gonna quite do describe each and every one. <laughs> I would say the mo majority of those are actually small changes to DNA that don't affect a lot. The genome is really big. And tiny mutations that are basically have no consequence to the former function of a dog can still be used to track lineage. Um, and a lot of those markers are those neutral mutations. A few of those markers might also overlap with physical trait um, genes, but not so much because a lot of the breeds um, share those physical trait genes. So beagles and basset hounds, they have a lot of the same um, genetic variants that go into determining their coat color and their white spotting and their floppy ears. Um, so those also actually aren't too great. The physical appearance um, genes aren't too great of a predictor of breed. It's really these small changes that can track lineages that are important. And those usually don't have any consequence to the dog's health or function. They're just markers. So how many markers are we using 
are you using to make recalls? 680,000, although that might change or increase as we introduce a new breed to the panel, because I like to reselect the markers for what helps us best distinguish between those breeds. So if we suddenly have 105 breeds, I'll want to redefine which markers we're using because I could find ones that are more informative for telling us um, the difference between flat-coated retrievers, Labradors, and Chesapeake Bays. So one of our um, questions is about corgis specifically. Love corgis. They're so, cute. <laughs> They're so great. So I know you you talked about the genomic return has some stuff to do with their little cute short legs. Yeah, and their stubby tails. Yeah. Yeah. So what? So the question was actually why are the bobtails seem to be unpredictable? And yeah. can you, yeah. And what about? Oh, here I'm just going to read you this question. Fluffy corgis cause quite the kerfuffle with breed standard purists. That's a wonderful they? sentence. <laughs> but should they? <laughs> but should they? <laughs> I mean, I would love a fluffy corgi, honestly. <laughs> um, not for show, for a companionship course. For snowflake, because the, obviously. Yeah. Depending on the breed standard, they, they wouldn't be allowed to show. But as a pet to pet, <laughs> fluffy all the way. <laughs> The short legs are really interesting because um, that's actually what we call a jumping gene. It's this ancient virus in the DNA that had taken one gene in dogs, taken it out of the DNA and placed it somewhere else. And this has happened um, twice that we know of in dog history, maybe more. Um, and it's what resulted in those shorter legs that corgis carry. And I think that's just so cool kind of the genome isn't just the static, non-changing, or doesn't change very much thing. Sometimes there's these really big changes that happen. And it's like, this happens a lot in dogs where the genes jump around in the DNA. And I think there's an entire lab dedicated to studying that I met a little while back. That's really cool. It kind of leads into there some other questions around um, how, how, how does a breed become a breed? How do you have a, a breed that then all of a sudden we have a name for it? And, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about this idea of village dogs yeah, and how we end up where we are. Yeah, when we think about village dogs, which um, for anyone that's unfamiliar with them, the majority of dogs in the world aren't really show dogs or intentionally bred dogs, but dogs that just live around people. They live in your town. They live across the world globally. There are village dogs everywhere. They're kind of like the default dog, kind of the, you know, blank slate, um, what a domestic dog is. Breeds are a little bit more, um, people intentionally breed them to meet some particular standard. For working dogs, um, like farm dogs, that standard is that they perform well on a farm, they do the job that is useful um, for people. For show dogs, it's that they, um, represent this lineage of dogs that uh, people wanted to maintain and preserve. So meeting the physical appearance of those dogs and participating in shows. So really breeds are a human made definition. It's really people driven. If you want something to be a breed and Jessica will probably speak to this, you just need a lot of people to be dedicated towards making it a breed. Um, there are a variety of kennel clubs, um, not just the AKC, but the UKC too. Uh, two of the breeds we added um, to the reference panel are actually not AKC breeds, but United Kennel Club breeds uh, like English Shepherd and American Pitbull Terrier. Um, there are other breed clubs out there. So, and I think I've heard of a few different mixed breed dogs that have become breeds of their own. Um, I think there's a Labradoodle type dog called Australian Cobber Dog that's become kind of a breed of its own. We have so many more questions. Um that we don't have time to get to today. We'll try to answer as many of these as we can on the dog park in the next few days. But I'd love to end with a question from Maisa. Um, is there something that you found particularly surprising or unexpected in your research so far? In my research with Dog Aging Project? Well, I don't know that this is a spoiler, but of the dogs we sequenced so far, I did find one with wolf ancestry, which is really interesting. Not a lot of wolf ancestry, it looked like they were um, a sled dog with a little bit of wolf in them. Cool. I saw that when I was looking at the coefficients of inbreeding and there was one dog that was 
really outbred, like very high genetic diversity. And it makes sense if they're admixed with the wild population. Yeah. They, just, they stood out. Nice. So, so I'm interested in that dog. I wish I could know more about them. I've been kind of keeping my eyes off of the survey data um, so far to kind of keep myself unbiased when I'm doing the trait predictions. Mm -hmm. But I'm so curious about that participant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. And do they, is that something they've self-reported? I I don't know. I don't know. I haven't looked into it. I know. That's very exciting. Kathleen, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been so much fun for me. I really appreciate it. I've had a great time. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, everyone. So uh, I just want to remind everybody else uh, that when this is done, you can share this link with anybody else who might want to have their mind blown with canine genomics. Uh, if you're a member of the pack, don't forget to go on the dog park thread and post questions and enter our giveaway. And if you are not part of the Dog Aging Project pack yet, you can go to dogagingproject.org, nominate your dog, and you will be part of this big dog family. Uh, we'd love to have you, the more the merrier for sure. And I know a lot of people are excited to be part of the genetic portion of this study. Um, I said, we would love to be able to sequence every single dog in the pack and maybe eventually we'll get there. Um, but right now be patient for us. Um, we're inviting as many dogs as quickly as we can to join this study. Um, and we're so grateful for your collaboration in this work. We certainly could not do any of it without you and your wonderful dogs. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it, everybody. Yeah, thank you so many thanks. And I'll join over in the park and see if I can answer any questions on the thread too. Thanks, Kathleen. That would be Thank awesome. You. I appreciate it.